Hey, it's Mike Tyson. And Hot Boxing is on vacation now. We'll be back soon with some hardcore off the wall sh real soon. For now, just enjoy this rerun. When Tyson Fury was on my show, I'm a big fan of Tyson Fury. He's named after me, and I want him to have all the success in the world. And just check out this episode. Andy Ruiz. Andy Ruiz. I think his uh, win over Joshua was a very good win on two weeks' notice. Yeah, how would you fight him? I would tie one hand behind me back oh, and use no. either one. <laughs> And just jab his knot right up. Pop, 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 pop. <laughs> that would be the easiest fight ever. Oh, God. <laughs> I love that. Is that a fight you're looking forward to? Hey, everybody. Welcome to a very special episode of Hot Boxing. I'm Evan Britton. And I'm Mike Tyson. And Mike, we've got the champ. The champ in here, Tyson Fury. What's Hello, everybody, on, a.k.a. the Gypsy King is in the building. Right, the Gypsy King. King. Oh, we love it, man. man. Tell us about that Gypsy lifestyle. What's that That's about? what I'm was, interested yeah, in. Yeah, I was seeing on television my big fat Gypsy this or that or this. Yeah. Is it about that, your guy, or is it about um, Brad Pitt stuff? Remember oh, stuff from like, Snatch? Oh, Snatch movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stuff, yeah. That yeah. was actually a good movie. But did, it, do you think, did that depict the Gypsy culture well? Um, not really. No, it's television, no. and they, yeah. they do stuff on TV to sell. To of sell. course. So you'd never really get to know what it was like off a TV show. Yeah, of course. So who's, what's the history of the gypsies? goes back thousands of years. Um, about it. They've been around since Christ? Yeah, they've been around since Christ. Um, Christ. They've been moving from country to country. Every country you go to around the world, you find gypsies. Um, so they've been around since the beginning of the dawn, huh? Yeah, beginning of time. Yeah. People, they come from all over the world, all different types, breed, seed, generations of people. Um, I, obviously, I come from England. I've been born and raised there. Is um, it a way of life or is it just a religion? What is it? It's yeah. not a religion, no. It's like a culture. Yeah. Huh. Um, it's just sort of, we're brought up, the only thing we want to do is fight, which is huh. why I've become a boxer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you were named after Mike. Named after Mike, well, yes. Well, that shit happened? Tell me about that. <laughs> that, so, I'll tell you how it happened. Uh, my dad was a professional boxer in yeah. the uh, late 80s, early 90s, heavyweight. And his hero was you. Really? So when I was born August the 12th, 1988, I came into the world and I was eight weeks premature and I was, I was dying. I wasn't supposed to live. Holy and when God. I lived, uh, my dad said, I'm going to call you after my favourite heavyweight, uh, Tyson. And the doctor said, no, that's not going to be a good name. He's not going to be very big, this guy. Really? <laughs> <laughs> when I was born, I only weighed one pound in weight. I was tiny. Wow. And I grew up to be six foot nine and 265 yeah, pounds. Wow. Incredible. Crazy. Shit. Unbelievable, So how did man. it feel? You started off boxing. What did that feel like? It felt really good, you know. I started boxing. I never had my first amateur fight until I was like 16 years old. Yeah. But I was brought up around boxing. I was a gym rat. When my dad was going to the gym, I'd go to the gym with him and I'd be hitting the bags, knocking stuff over in the gym. I was brought up around it. My brothers, cousins, everybody boxes. Mm. So we all used to fight each other as kids growing up. Um, and I decided I was going to be heavyweight champion of the world from being a young kid. When people say, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, I want to be uh, whatever they wanted to be. They asked me what I want to be. I said, heavyweight champion of the world. I love it. And nothing, I wasn't yeah. going to settle for anything else. That's it was, how it goes. That's yeah. what it is. That's what it is. And so that must be such a wild journey. I think about when I was a fighter, and that must have been such a wild journey fighting with yourself. Yeah. You know, you're just wondering, God, I don't, want to hope this, I don't want this guy to take my place, always wondering. Yeah. You know, you hurt yourself, you get a cut, and you say, oh, I hope my career is not over or something before it even starts. Yeah. You know, there's just a lot of things. Oh, there's a lot of motiva motivating factors when you're young. We all lose on the path to our greatness, you know? And it's about overcoming and never quitting and never giving up. So fighting is a huge part of the gypsy culture. Maybe just the fighting spirit. How about... You know, you're not the first gypsy heavyweight champion. It must have been gypsy bare knuckle champion, heavyweight bare knuckle champion. There was. There was um, a guy called Gypsy Jem Mace. Yes. Jim and he Mace, was yeah. he was the first heavyweight champion yeah. under wow. Queen's rules. 1850 bare knuckle champion. That's correct. From Norfolk, they called him the Swatham yeah. Gypsy. Wow. That's amazing. Very good looking, though. Unlike me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've... There's been a lot of uh, gypsy champions, not just heavyweights. There's been middleweights from all over the world, different weight categories. Well, I imagine you grow up fighting. 
It's in your blood. You're going to be pretty comfortable in a fight, no matter where you are, whether it's in a ring or in the street somewhere. Um, what is the, the spiritual practice or mindset of the gypsy culture? Did you grow up with, with a sense of a higher power? Yeah, I believe in God. Uh-huh. You know, I'm a um, Christian. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I believe that we're all here for a reason. I believe that everything I, I do in my life is already planned and set. You know, there's so, been so many things happen to me throughout my life, and if there was no higher power, then it wouldn't be possible for me to be here. Even in the fight with Wilder, like, brought me off the canvas yeah. in round 12 when I was knocked out to raise me to my feet and uh, to fight on for a reason. And I believe the second return for me in boxing, because I had three years out the ring. I was down with depression and anxiety. I put on 147 pounds. I was taking drugs on a daily basis. I was drinking on a daily basis. I was gone. Mm. I was finished. The only place I ever thought that I'd ever end up was in a padded room somewhere. Um, mm. it, it was terrible. I was thinking about suicide every day. And I had nothing to be upset about. I was, I was heavyweight champion of the world. I was 27 years old. I had money, fame, glory, a family, achievements, kids. Everything running so smooth, but... It didn't matter because mental health will bring you to your knees if you let it. Absolutely. We talk about that a lot. I understand. You know, when I was a young kid and I was fighting, I was going through all everything was so everything was so intensified. Oh, shit, this and that. And then it's just an illusion. It didn't really matter. Yeah. You know what I mean? It never really existed. Mm-hmm. What was it, Tyson, that helped bring you out of that? Boxing. Mm. Boxing brought me back because I was living very wild. And, you know, when you when you lose the passion to breathe fresh air anymore and you don't want to live, you're in a terrible place. Um, and I remember a moment I was in a I was in a high performance car, a Ferrari, I was heading towards a bridge doing that. Yeah, Ferrari that big was it custom made for you? No, it wasn't custom made, <laughs> no. but I squashed it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I was up, I heading towards this bridge at a high speed, 190 miles an hour, and I was going to crash into a bridge. And before I hit this bridge, I got to about maybe 500 foot from the bridge. And I heard a voice. I physically heard a voice speak to me and say, stop, don't do this. And I pulled over. I remember I was shaking. I was crying. I was thinking. I knew I was totally gone. I didn't think I'd ever come back. Uh, like boxing was the last thing I ever cared about at this position um, and I remember thinking you know what if I'm ever going to get right again I've got to get fit I've got to lose the weight I wasn't losing the weight to come back to return to the fight game I was losing it for me for my health and the more I trained the more I was getting better and better by the day um, I lost a lot of weight quickly and I was I was feeling good I was feeling great again and I wanted to get back in the ring. I, I, I felt like I had a lot more to to offer, uh, a lot more to give. Uh, retirement wasn't for me. I had three years out the ring and it was, it was a horrible three years, the worst three years of my active life. And I thought, I'm going to get back in the ring. I'm going to fight again. How did they let you keep your title for that long? Did they strip you? Yeah, I had... Uh, four world titles and I they stripped me of one within seven days and I vacated the rest yeah I vacated the rest and then I came back had a couple of uh, easy knockover fights and then jumped straight back in with uh, Wilder that was your first fight back yeah wow and that fight really I feel like captivated the world that that Everybody fight was happy after that it really fight. brought Everybody, people back a into time boxing ago, people be happy like that people were very happy yeah it was so exciting, you know, to see two titans back in the ring clashing yeah. like that. You know, at that time, it was a breath of fresh air because there was an heavyweight in England called Joshua. He was a world champion and he was unbeaten. And Wilder was over here. He was in the UK and he was talking back and forth for like over a year. Like bullshit. They didn't want to fight each other. Mm. So I think it was more Joshua didn't want to fight Wilder rather than the other way around. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to fight. Give me the fight. So they looked at me and they thought, this guy's finished. He can't fight no more. How can you lose all that weight and have all that time out the ring abusing your body and then come back to this level? But maybe I was finished in my body, but my mindset was that strong and I believed that I was going to win. That 
if you believe it first with the mind, anything's achievable. I agree. Um, and I believed it so much and I, ne I never ever doubt myself in a fight no matter who it is with who I always believe I'm going to win somehow some way I'll find a way and um, we put on a great fight and you know people are looking forward to the uh, to rematch yeah hell yeah is that in the books yet? Is that do you want to yet? fight a belt before you fight the rematch? Yeah, I'm fighting on September the 14th in yeah, Vegas the guy name again? Uh, yeah, some man. Swedish guy called Otto oh, Wallen yeah well okay He's a number four ranked WBA, unbeaten in 20 fights, 6'6", six, six, southpaw. So he might take a couple of rounds to get him out of there. <laughs> That'll be awesome, man. That's amazing. So at 27, you're a world champion. And that was the pinnacle. That was the peak of the mountain that your whole life you had been striving to get to, right? What was it in that that, you weren't, you felt as though you weren't being fulfilled. You know, I suppose I suffered with depression and anxiety my whole life, from being a little boy to being a man. But I always had a goal of becoming heavyweight champion of the world. And it always brought me back out of the darkness to achieve that goal. And nothing else mattered. I had a lot of tragedy go on in my uh, life and a lot of stuff happen that maybe could have put me off track of being heavyweight champ, but I always sort of sidetracked all of that and concentrated on the job in hand. And when they said, right, you, you're gonna fight Klitschko for the, for the world championship, I was like, hmm, when I win, I'm not gonna have a goal anymore. So I almost knew going into the fight that I was gonna come down, it was gonna be a disaster. I, w I was very depressed going into the fight, going into training camps. I knew I was gonna beat this guy. Um, and I said to, I remember saying to me, to me dad, and my brothers, I said, win, lose, or draw. I said, I probably won't fight again after this. Um, really? And he's like, why, why was what? that? You boxed all your life to get to this position, and you're going to just walk away. I was like, you know what? I'm not feeling it anymore. But I look back on it now, and I was very ill going into that fight. I wasn't well minded. Goes in there, beats him. For five minutes, I was happy. And then when I got back to the changing room, I thought, is this it? I've won five world title belts. I beat the second longest reigning heavyweight champion in history. What next? I don't have a purpose anymore. I'm finished. Oh, that's weird, man. Because when I was a little kid and I won the title, I think I fell so in love with that illusion of myself and shit. Really? Hell fucking So you were yeah. like, let me conquer more. Hell let me yeah, that's dominate. Absolutely. Let me yeah. destroy more people. Let it be more about me. Let me have the best girl in the world. Let me have the best seat in the fucking restaurant. Give me the best fucking car. I want the best plane. I was fucking all so self-absorbed. Mm. You know what I mean? I couldn't fuck enough girls. Mm. Couldn't have enough fights. Couldn't have enough fights outside the ring. It's enough couldn't... power. Yeah, it wasn't enough. Yeah. It's so interesting because yeah. I very much relate to what you're saying, you know, yeah. that feeling of what's next. This is it. This is everything I've, I've, every bit of my life that I've dedicated to achieving this thing and I did it. Now what the fuck am I? Doing? But that, that's just my negative outlook right. on everything. Yeah, that's, like, because, that's because we don't have no outlook on self-love Yeah. back then. When you don't have no self-love, it's so easy to say, that's it. Yeah. When you have self-love, you find so many intimate things to do with yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Just... You know, I played football for everyone but me. I played football to prove everybody wrong, to show everybody how powerful and dominant and scary I was. I played football to destroy other people, to inflict my pain on others. And I never once was playing it just because I loved it, you know? And that's a much more sustainable source of I power. A lot of athletes are entertainers, they're just actors, and people in general with jobs being that way, because this is our acceptance. Yeah. They're not going to give you the same acceptance if you're not playing on that team than if you're just a um, retired player. It's a different kind of acceptance. Yeah. You're not going to get the same fucking girlfriend that you did as a fucking big football player than you would as a retired player. So it's all about continuing to do this stuff and this is our life. Mm -hmm. We do this till we can't do it anymore. Yeah. It becomes our identity. Yeah. And we can't even help it. We got go to we gotta go to a school to learn how to get out of that shell of ourselves, that mask of our identity. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. Um, and it sounds like in those three years out, 
and then finding that passion again, you tapped into something a little deeper in yourself. 100%. You know, the first time I was boxing, the first career, I call it two careers. The first time was about achieving my dreams, becoming an heavyweight champion of the world and, and, and all that sort of stuff we just talked about, all that power and what if and all this stuff. But when I got there, I thought like, this is a lot of shit. It wasn't what I expected. And from England, that's really hard because England, they look at boxers and fighters from a total different different perspective. Yeah. They're like gods out there. So how do, you, how, how do you live that life in England? You can't go nowhere. Exactly. England, I know you can't go nowhere. Yeah. You can't go because they're waiting for you. Yeah, yeah that's they, true. You hang out here, there'd be 40,000 people waiting for you in England. They don't fuck around. That's crazy. With their fighters, their soccer players and stuff, their rugby players, they don't, they're with you 100%. Yeah. How many people, where did you fight? You fought them in America, right? Dante Wild. Yeah. How many How many um, people from the UK came over? About 7,000. Yeah, there was a lot, a lot of British fans travelled. But like the second career, it's not about winning belts or anything. I've, I'm just having fun. You know, I, I box now because... I love to fight, and I finally found what I love to do. What is that? And, and that's to be, be involved in, in good fights and, and, and take punches and hit people back. You know, I go into these fights, and I don't give a fuck. You know, I'm like a loose cannon, a crazy character. I don't care if they hit me. I don't care what they do. I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm going to have fun in the fight. They're all serious, like, oh, my God, this yeah. is a fight. Ah, yeah. and I'm like doing dances, yeah. fucking waving my arms in the air, singing to them. I noticed that. I don't care anymore, you know. I, I, I've gone past the stage of caring about a fight. Who was your last fight? I boxed in Vegas yeah. uh, in June 15. I boxed a German guy called Tom Schwartz. That's right. And uh, I watched all of that pre-fight stuff, man, and your energy was unbelievable. Like you were it's smiling. Yeah. You were putting on a show. We're in the entertainment business. Yeah. I was in Las Vegas. I was there to put on a show. I did that. I won the fight. Yeah. On to the next one. Yeah. You know, I'm having fun. I've never been as happy as this in my whole career. That's awesome. Never. I'm so happy right now, so mentally well, so unconcerned about what people think of me. Andy Ruiz. Andy Ruiz. I think his uh, win over Joshua was a very good win on two weeks' notice. Yeah, how would you fight him? I would tie one hand behind me back oh, and use no. either one. <laughs> And just jab his nut right off. Pop, 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 pop. <laughs> that would be the easiest fight ever. Oh, God. That's <laughs> I love that. Is that a fight you're looking forward to? I'm going to fight this guy uh, on the 14th, and then we're going to go for the Wilder rematch February 22nd. Nice. And then this time, I'm not going to leave it to the judges. It's going to go over within four or five rounds. And we're going to Do move on. to fight anybody since your guy fought? He fought somebody else. Yeah, he, he fought one fight before. Fight. He fought Dominic Only Brazil. one round. Knockout. One round knockout. And he's oh, fighting yeah. uh, Lewis Ortiz in his next fight. So. On rematch? Yeah. Yeah. I think that'll go quicker this time now. Lewis good. Ortiz is 147 years old. <laughs> you don't know how old he is, right? They come <laughs> from um, Cuba. They, they fight forever. Just, they'll just keep doing yeah, it. Yeah, amateur fights forever. Tyson, what do you think about like back in the day, Mike had 15 fights in a year. Or before that, Sugar Ray Robinson had like 100 yeah. fights in a year. And now, how many fights do you have in a year? Maybe three. It's crazy. It is crazy. But when you're starting off at the beginning, you can have all these fights. I, in my first year as a professional, I had nine fights. Mm. And then the, the more you step up, the more the, the fights become less. Because uh -huh. they need more time to build them, more time to sell them. Uh. You know, I wish I could fight. 10 times a year once a month would be good yeah. I offered to do a bum a month campaign like Joe Lewis they said won't let you do it they won't let me do it the, the, um, the poss poss possibility of him getting hurt you know they just don't do that anymore I'd love to keep very active like if I can get three fights a year I think that's me being very active mm. I had a lot of time inactive Yeah, like one fight per year one fight in three years yeah. just craziness seems like you get out of rhythm with yeah. yourself you get bit. on mat you become match fit and then you lose it all yeah. And you'd be go rusty again. You need another couple of fights to get back where he was. Yeah. So is it a matter of them promoting the fights? Like, who is your contract with as a boxer? Is it with the promoter? Or is it with, like, is it, is it with a league? No, it could be with the hotel. It could be with it the hotel. It could be with the hotel. It could be with the television station. 
company. Wow. Interesting. Oh, like so he, like Showtime. Like he, could have a co- or... he could have a contract with Showtime to fight a um, certain amount of time for a certain amount of money a year. Oh. Interesting. That's and way then after, different. Then, I, then besides that, they will pay him. Well, if he's in the West Coast, like a casino or something, the casino, mostly in the West Coast, like Vegas, will pay him a certain amount of money to fight a certain amount of time at their hotel. Mm. Mm. You know? And so the casinos have really been kicking, like, the, um, the East Coast um, auditoriums in the butt because we're paying you to come fight in our auditorium where you got to pay these big um, auditoriums to fight in their arena. Mm. So, you know, it's really a, a no-brainer. What are the big casinos that... Um, MGM Grand. MGM. Yeah, that's just one of them. There's, there's Do a, dozens of them now. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I fought the last fight at the MGM Grand. Okay. Where's this fight coming up? This fight's at a new new arena in uh, Vegas called the T-Mobile Center. Okay. Yeah, I've been there. It's, it's a brand new one, yeah. Before. It's like a 20,000-seater. Awesome. That'll be cool. How are you dealing with, you know, your success and continuing to build yourself up in your new career? Like I said, I don't see it as success. I don't see it as anything. I just live day to day. I love that. You know, when when you're like me, I could be happy now and suicidal in the evening. Uh huh. Yeah. So when you live like that, are you I on can, medication? No, right my now, medication is training. No, you need some fucking pills, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I fail every Vada drugs test in the world. Then, but um, yeah, I just I train. I tra- my medicine is, has become training. I used to like just train for a fight, go out of camp and put on a ton of weight, not train, just eat shit all the time, drink a lot. I do the same thing. And I'm, on the second time I'm coming back, like I'm staying in shape the whole time. Uh-huh. I'm training every day for me, not just for a sport, for me to keep myself mentally well and strong. And the training camps and lifestyle of a boxer has become very easy for me now. So I box at 265 pounds. I walk around at 265 pounds. Yeah. Where before I was walking Good. around at 370 pounds. Or more, 400. Jesus, dude, 370. I would never stay in shape um, in the off seasons. You wouldn't. If I didn't have a fight, like when I stopped fighting three and four times a year, like if I, um, I would just, boom, I would just fight and I wouldn't train no more. I used to go gorging and drinking and yeah. fucking. That's all I did. We have to fight. People, I get it. People be in my room before I even get there. It's, it's just they knew that was the, the norm. It's, all, it's really a form of, that's how you understand self-care at that time. You're like this is taking care of myself because now I got to just rest and recover and replenish and gorge myself. No, nah, that's just I didn't ha- I didn't have good um, life skills back then. Yeah, you well, know? that's what I'm saying. That was my what you was thought. Should've, my brain should have just said, "You stay in shape." Yeah, keep running though. Don't 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 go to the gym. You just keep running every day. Just keep your cardio. Yeah, up. keep the cardio up. Yeah. So you know when you was doing all this fucking all the time. <laughs> Did you catch many diseases? Lots of them. Yeah. <laughs> Tons of them. Tons of them. That's part of, that's part of being the guy that gets all the girls, too. I know they say, no, not me. I didn't that comes to me. with but that. But if, if you that guy that fucked everybody, that comes with it, too. Yeah. You know? Yeah, man. So I was recently over in Spain, and someone said, oh, no, don't fuck that girl. She's got herpes. I said, well, she fucks me. She's going to have chlamydia, gonorrhea, oh, everything else, too. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Oh, fuck. That's uh, fucked up. I caught a kissing disease one day. My, 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 um, what is this? My, Mono? Yeah, my fucking, um. Your lymph nodes? No, yeah, these fucking glands exposed. Swelled up? Ooh, I look like a fucking toad. A toad? Yeah, those big glands, yeah. Wow. Fuck. You couldn't believe it. I feel like I was dying. Really? It feels like, oh, you pain like no other. You don't believe it's so much pain. Are you sure that was some kissing and not pussy licking? That too. <laughs> that too, yeah. It goes, it goes both ways. You get it both ways. Oh, oh yeah, you either one. Ways. Yeah, you get it both ways. Oh, fuck. So oh, my God. This is a good God. conversation. It's like yeah, full, man. Dirty like secrets fucking, for us. Every yeah. time you turn around, there's a fucking needle going in your ass. What's have, the needle in the ass for? I have penicillin kits now, so. Penicillin. Penicillin? Yeah. 
<laughs> Thankfully, I've never contracted any uh, STDs. You're, you're you I'm ain't doing out. it right now. I lucked out, man. Do you get any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I got uh, got four brothers, no sisters. Yeah, oh, five brothers, no sisters. Tasked their own house. Wow. Uh, yeah. Were you guys fighting all the time? All the time. Yeah. Me and my younger brother, we used to fight every day, all the time. And I've got a younger brother again. He was also a professional boxer. Fighter. Yeah, he had. I think he had nine pro fights. Yeah. Um, but he had a bad eye, uh. so he had to retire from boxing. Uh. He would have been good. He was uh, sh he was short but compact and powerful. Mm. Heavyweight. Heavyweight, yeah. How tall? Me he was about six foot. Six foot. Six foot and two hundred and fifty pounds. Mm. Yeah. Stocky. Do you have a family? Yeah, I got a wife and uh, five kids. Wow. Five kids. Really? Five kids. You don't yeah. look like that type, dude. But We're aiming for ten. Yeah. I'm aiming for ten. Ten kids. Awesome. Yeah. You gotta work hard, dude. Hundred percent. Gotta keep it going. Yeah, there's ten. Ten is a lot. What is, Are it, you? is it a lot to live in England? You live in England, right? Yeah. Is it um the cost of living high there? Yeah, it's expensive, yeah. Yeah, I would think so, yeah. Everybody I know that lived there fucking live over there means they gotta get it together. It's really expensive. Yeah. I, I think I think America's expensive though as well. You really think so? Yeah. Wow. Some cities, yeah. You think so? You, all these, man, you see that tax game over there is a monster, man. Really? Yeah, like over there, you get 50% tax and 20% value. That's 70% of the money gone. Yeah. Bam. Whoa. Whoa. Fuck. Fuck. That's fucking But brutal. once you pay the taxes, you're cool. They don't take no other stuff out. You got to pay. Over here, they tax you for everything. They're going to tax you for your clothes. They're going to tax you for that bag. That so you they don't pay taxes food on food and... No, clothing and no. Like over here, you see a price, and then you go to the till, and they want tax on top of that. Yeah. At home, it's it's all included. Uh huh. Yeah. So yeah. You take it out when they give you the check. Interesting. I guess that's a good trade off. How do you feel about it? You yeah. know, it's one of those things. Isn't it? it is all, what it we're is. All, we're all guaranteed two things in life: death and taxes. No, but listen, you it, can't you escape to, any of them. You have to look at it from this perspective, though. Even though they have a lot. Of all the billionaires, there's more billionaires coming out of England and moving to England than any place in the world. I don't know why England, if they're so worried about the taxes. There has to be some kind of tax loophole where they're not threatened like they are over here. I'm sure there are loopholes. No doubt about it, because everybody's going to England. Rich people really know how to maneuver and navigate the taxes. You know. It's not. You don't have to be rich. You just have to be educated. Yeah. No matter. We yeah. pay their taxes understand. for them. We pay their taxes. Yeah. Yeah, it's fucked up. Um, well, still, I suppose you pay a, a high tax bracket to live in a safe place. Yeah. You know, imagine if you lived in a third world country. Yeah. And you're getting stabbed and killed every second on your doorstep. Yeah. But you're not so. paying taxes. Mm. So over there, it's clean place to live, quite safe. Yeah. Um, it's about it, really. It's great. What are you doing in L.A.? I'm here in L.A. Uh, we've got some press for the fight. Nice. Uh, I think I've got to go to ESPN Studios in a bit. Awesome. Do a bit there and a few more uh, interviews and things. Awesome. Just to promote the fight for September the 14th. You Back think you should age and put you in a movie and do it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, you'd be great. Go man. down the street over there and go on, go on the set and hang out. They would love to hang out with you on the set. Down the street? No, we're just going to go back and uh, do the chill out. Oh, yeah, yeah. I call that down the street. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you have any interest in that, acting? Mm, not really, No. to be fair. Uh, how about... You never know what the future holds, though. I know, Maybe man. if it was a porn pornographic movie, then. <laughs> a porno? <laughs> no, I think I love you, dude. That'd be yeah. interesting. What do you see for life after boxing, or even thinking that far? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to become a professional pussy licker after boxing. <laughs> no way, Jose. Don't I laugh reckon I can that. get you a job there too, no, Mike. Well, I'm retired, dude. I'm retired. Mike's retired. Uh, so that'd be my oh. ideal job. Oh. You, you have milk on your tongue, tongue, dude. Don't do that. <laughs> That's the healthy. Oh. Too many diseases out there. Do you um, know what I want to do after boxing? I want to, um, I want to start a heavyweight fight factory mm. and bring in heavyweights from all over the world and um, have them in, a, in one facility, sharpening each other up and uh, try and take them further, heavyweight champions. 
I love that. That's heavyweight training ground, mm. basically. Heavyweight breeding ground. I love that. It's awesome, man. Well, as a young fighter, what is your what are your options? How do you how do you get in? You just have to find a gym and you know, you work with all the other fighters. Is that the best best situation? I suppose so. Yeah. yeah. How does a guy get to a gym? I um I just people discover me and say, Hey, wandered you need to into box. One. I want you to box or something. Yeah, how did that happen? Yeah. How did it well you grew up in it? I grew up around boxing, so yeah. it was very easy for me to uh, get involved in it. Yeah. And with England being a small place, small country, yeah, it's like if you're any good at all, then you're going to be selected to box for uh, for the country in, in tournaments all over the world. Yeah. So, yeah, I used to walk to the gym every day, though, me and my little brother. I used to jog there. He used to ride a bike. Nice. And uh, train two hours, three hours, and set, run back. It's um, awesome. But without them opportunities to do that, then I maybe wouldn't even be here today. Who knows? Yeah. So that's another thing I would like to do, open up an amateur boxing club to give other people opportunities that I had in my life. It's, it's definitely needed. Absolutely. Sure. If I ever had to pay to be a boxer, I would have never been a boxer. I had no money. Yeah. I learned free how to box. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, I'm sure there's millions of kids who would love that opportunity, you know? Have somewhere to go, get instructed, or be it's under like a the, family affair. Once you get yeah, into the family. gym and that family life, you know everybody knows what you're doing. Everybody got their eye open, got their friends and family got their eye open. He's involved with the gym. He's one of the boys. Look out for him. It was just an incredible lifestyle. Yeah. Tyson, is there anything you any questions you have for Mike as you prep for this next fight? Not really, you know. No. Not really. I don't have many questions. Yeah, that's good. I mean, that's a good place to be. Is there anything you're curious about Mike and his oh. new life after boxing? My well, new life is pretty interesting. I, that's, that's understandable. Okay, yeah, go for it. Yeah, this new life of yours is giving you a new lease of life. Yeah, thank God. Because my last, my last fucking life was a <laughs> monstrosity. <laughs> Whoa, I don't even know how this all this shit happened, man. Fuck. Uh, but without all that catastrophic action, would you be the same man you are today without the experience? Oh, I need that experience, yeah. You're a living legend. I'm sat here with a living legend. Yeah, well, I'm just glad I'm living. You know, <laughs> I'm just glad I'm living. <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. I can't believe I wanted to die so, so often when I was younger. I said, God, I hate living. Now I get 53, I love living. I don't want to fucking die. I hate the fact that I got to die now. Because living is so interesting. It is, man. Every day is a What's the motivation, adventure. Mike, now? Excuse me? What's the motivation? Just for me. It's to ex absorb my existence, you know, and realize that life is a joke. I took it too serious. hundred percent. You know? Not, um, I don't know. Not long after this, I'll die soon, and I won't exist anymore. And, I'm a, and then I have to go to the other world. I want to see what that's like. I can't believe this energy that I have just dies and it doesn't exist. It may not live here no more, but it has to go somewhere. 100%. You know? And that's what I'm looking forward to now. Not for a long time yet, though. Whenever it happens, it happens. But I'm just looking forward to it. Because life is great, so death has to be just as great as life. You can't think the worst, the, worst, the worst day of my life, right, is my mother or my children dying or whatever. The worst day of my life... Besides that incident that happened, that could have happened to anybody, probably happened to everybody all over the world at that time, life is still beautiful. My worst day in life is still a beautiful day. If I, if I don't get, um, take internalizing, oh, woe is me and my mother died or my baby died, why me? If I don't look at it from that perspective, life was always beautiful. Every day was beautiful, you know? Life is precious. And it's beautiful just to wake up in the morning. Before, before I used to take it all for granted. I didn't care. I didn't care about nothing. I didn't care about family, friends, relatives, achievements. I didn't care about fuck all. I just, just didn't care. But now, after going to hell and back, I appreciate fresh air and a glass of water. Gratitude. Smaller things in life. Gratitude. Because when you've lost, you never know what you've really got until it's gone. Yeah. But I've had the opportunity to be shot down and come back. You know, and you really find out who your friends are, who the people are really 
behind you, who leaves, who jumps off, and, and everybody just loves a winner. Nobody wants to be around a loser. Nobody wants to be around a man who's lost his mind. So you really find out who your friends are, the people who call you in distress when you're down and you're out and you don't have any more to offer to them. So I suppose I got to see that side of everything without being beaten in a boxing ring first. So then on the comeback, I have the smallest team ever. The people who were there for me when I was gone, when I was out. So yeah, I keep it nice and small. I'm happy for every day. And whatever happens in life happens. I don't care. We just have to understand that being fighters, being entertainers, anything. It's being in the light that we have to understand that this is will be over soon. This is not going to last forever. So why, why, at this moment, while it's an enormous and it's profitable, I have to make the best I can out of it. That's what this is all about now with him. He has to make the best yeah. possible moves for his future right now while he can. Yeah. You know? It's interesting hearing you say, because I know this as well, is that before you said you didn't give a fuck about anything. And now you don't care but in a different way. It's like you're detached with love from it all. You know, and I think that's an important, dis that's, a, that's a difference, you know? But it's interesting because it's the flip side of the same coin, mm -hmm. you know? Going from a place of not caring about anything in your life in a destructive way, and then coming to a place where you cannot care about anything in life because you're not attached to anything or any specific outcome or how anything is supposed to be or look. Do you know before I used to take everything and think, oh, I want this, I want that. I was never happy with what I've got. Mm. It's human nature, we always want more. Yeah. And no matter yeah. what it is, no matter how much you've got of something, then you're always searching for more things. I think that's ego nature. No doubt about it. That's the nature of the ego. And now it's like, I don't care if I, if I lose everything. I don't care what happens. Nothing really is ours anyway in life. Mm -hmm. We only borrow it right. until we die, then it all goes. Yep. The only thing we truly own in this life is moments in time. Mm. Like, this is a moment in time for me that will never be erased. Mm. And no matter what happens, this is always going to be my time. Yep. This will be my moment in time because I lived here and I was a part of this. Yep. You know, everything else, this bag, this watch, these clothes, they will all go. Fuck for it. Yeah. What does it really yeah. matter? Yeah. Yeah, your body. Even your body. body will go. This is a shell. Yeah. But what's inside, hope to God, lives on forever. Definitely does. You know, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, um, maybe not living on forever is cool too. Yeah. You know, we don't know that yet. Maybe yeah. it's maybe it's um, stop hearing our fucking selves and, and talking about us and thinking about ourselves in our minds sometimes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Maybe that's cool enough to stop that. That's bliss. Yeah, they just have no thoughts. Yeah. You know? But like you said before, though, why are we here? What's we our have purpose? all these experiences yeah. and what, we just switch us off after you close your eyes? Can't be possible. Yeah. But that's the ultimate question, isn't it? What happens when you die? Maybe, yeah. maybe, we, wake, <laughs> maybe, maybe we wake up. <laughs> I reckon. We wake up. It's all a dream. We just wake up. What do you think, Tyson? Well, like I said before, I'm a practicing uh, Christian. Uh -huh. And the Bible says when you die, all the answers will be revealed. And everything will be like almost in HD. And everything you wanted to know in your life will be answered. But it also says that we'll be accountable for every action we did. So. I don't know. I, I just don't think. I think. Um. Even as a Muslim, a former Christian, I just believe that um, when I took the tour, I just believe there's no good and no bad. There's no right and no wrong. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's all Who are perception. We, how, we're not, our brain is not developed. Even at the height of its development, we're not developed really enough to understand why we did something right or wrong. We don't understand our selfishness, our greed, or our ego. We don't understand it. We can't even comprehend it. We can't even conceive it to another human being what it's really like when it's operating. We're nothing, who are we? We can't explain ourselves. What am I doing here? What the fuck am I doing here? I don't really know. I should be scared. I don't know me, I don't know you, I don't know him. What the fuck are we? I just know what my mind tell me everything is. And my mind is just not reliable most of the time. Yeah, especially when you've been indoctrinated with all of the materiality of life in modern culture, that. you know, you have to break out of that shit. I mean, really at the end of the day, our 
experiences and who we project into the world is just like everything that's going on in here. All our relationships that we have with everyone around us, all the things, all the attachments we have are about what's going on inside. Has God, you know, for actually, has God always been here? Did somebody create God? How did God come to existence? The thought. Good question. Yeah. Somebody would say, hey, there's something, something out here greater than me. I have to worship it. And I'm going to call it God. I mean, what is consciousness? Awareness of something that we don't see. You know? But we're definitely sure this is it. This is where you have to be. For now, at least. Yeah. I like the idea of, you know, when you die, all the, all the questions you have in life are answered. You know, I, I believe that's part of the deal for sure. The accountability thing, I believe in that to an extent of, you know, I think God is all forgiving and all accepting. And, you know, at the end of the day, it really comes down to your perception of yourself and your own ability to forgive yourself. You know, that's the ultimate test. Yeah. Because we're the hardest on ourselves of anyone. There's no one. I mean, there's no one else. You know, there's no one here inflicting. We're all angry because we don't have the answers, pretty much. Yeah. And we want to know everything. Cause we, uh, we based our acceptance on knowing stuff, too, being smart. You know when you hurt someone. You know when you inflict damage, you cause wreckage, you cause pain. You know what that is. And there's no one there to fix that but you. You know? You know how that feels. I know how it feels. You know? And at the end of the day, it all comes down to how do I feel about myself? You know? No matter what you do in your life, though. Yeah. It all comes down to you, whether you're a successful yep. athlete, whether you're a businessman, exactly. whether you've got a regular nine to five job. Yep. The, the biggest thing in the world is contentment yep. with who you are and what you are. Totally. I know plenty of rich people. I know billionaires and I know millionaires and 99.9% .9 of them ain't happy. Yeah, they're fucking miserable. Very unhappy people. Yeah. But then I know people who work nine to five for minimum wages and are so positive and so happy They've got the world by the ball. So don't ain't they in a better position than yep. the, everybody else who's like super rich and whatever because Absolutely. they're happy and contented with their life and their surroundings and everybody in it. Yep. Some people are not meant to concept concept have to grab that concept of happiness. Mm. Why do I have to search for happiness? It's too it's too difficult to search for it. Yeah. It's too complex. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's the moment. Happiness is moments. Nobody can have a whole hour of happiness. A whole, ten a whole years, lifetime. A whole 10 years of happiness. Yeah. How did, I mean, it's con consistently happy for 10 years. There's not a tenth of a second of miserable <laughs> shit going on. Even though somebody died. Well, they're gone, well, they're a hell of a person. The guy, you know, this is all happening. It happen. <laughs> this is not real. Yeah, it doesn't happen. I know. I've been posting a lot of this positive shit on my Instagram because I don't know what else to do with social media other than put positive shit out there, you know? And... Sometimes it comes off, I share my own experiences and people go like, oh, Webb, I'm sorry you're feeling down today or you're feeling angry today. And I'm like, I'm not fucking angry, dude. And I'm not feeling down. Those feelings and emotions come up, yes, but life is not about being happy and fucking excited all the time. You know, we're on a fucking wave of emotions that's constantly moving and flowing and just because you're up one minute doesn't mean life is great. And just because you're down the next doesn't mean life is shit. You know? I think you got to be thankful for all moments. Exactly. Good and bad. Like Mike it's said, all it's there. All, it's all a blessing. It's all a blessing. It's just our perception of it. A hundred times. Like, when I'm clean now, every now and then I say to myself, when I'm clean, I'm feeling perfect. I'm running. I'm working out. I'm eating good. Everything's good. And then every day I say, now what's going to call? What's going to happen to make what's me gonna relapse? What's gonna happen to make me want to get do some cocaine? What's gonna happen? What could happen? Because I feel like I'm invincible now. So what does it get? What does it could happen to make me do that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And why am I even thinking about something that would make me do that? Because that's one of my biggest fears: getting high again, mm. going out and fucking with people I don't even know. <laughs> mm. 
you know, put my life in some strangers' hands. Yeah. And that's the fucked up place where we've all been. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, my biggest fear, like you just said, Mike, is going back to drugs, mm. back to cocaine. Mm. And I know that I can never go back there. Yeah. I've got an addictive personality. If I'm doing anything, I do it fucking 100%. But I'm listen, drinking, I'm, so, I'm, drugs, I'm so I'm so controlled. It controls me so bad. It's really liquor, but I'm. So, I won't say I'm an alcoholic. I say I'm a drug addict. I'm this. I'm everything else. But I, I have to. I feel like my sick mind. I'm too proud to be an alcoholic. But I'm a big alcoholic. But in my mind, I don't want to say that. I'd rather be the drug addict. I, it's cooler to be the coke addict. I don't want to tell anybody I'm an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm just cool. a devil for the drink. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm embarrassed about too, being an alcoholic. Well, you know, those are such, it's such interesting labels because alcohol is really, it's just the substance you use to fill the hole. And it does a damn good jo- it job. Does, of, it does, the inc- I don't know what it know, does. It, it does, fucking, oh, fuck. you know, it's interesting to me, the labels that be, get put on because it's really an emotional sickness. You know, it's a it's a sickness of the mind. A spirituality. Spirituality. Yeah. It's a spiritual sickness. Yeah, no doubt about it. You know, and that just happens to be the thing that in this dimension we can take to to make it all go away for a moment. But I will say this: alcohol and drugs. If you're, if you're suffering with mental health problems, yeah. it makes it go away for like five minutes. Yeah. But when you wake up the next day, like it crashes avalanche. down even more. It's a tsunami. Oh, you tell 100%. yourself, I'm never going to do it again, and later on in the night, you're sipping. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tsunami. Worstest thing ever. Yeah. You know, know. If, if alcohol was invented today, it'd be a class A drug, for sure. Definitely. Mike said this before, and it's totally true. You know, you put a few guys in a room and a bottle of vodka. A few hours later, they're in a fist fight. Well, they're going to kill each other. They're going to kill each they're other. They're related, too. And they're going to kill each other. Yeah. And it's just amazing what alcohol can do. You smoke them. a joint with, with five or six people. They're going to start hugging each other. And shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> what are your feelings on cannabis? Do you stay completely away? Or are you completely sober these days? Yeah, I, uh, I've never been a weed smoker, to be honest. At okay. All. Um... Have you dabbled in CBD? No, nothing Non-psychoactive? Like that. No, I've never, I've never, the only drug of my choice was cocaine. Okay. Yeah, that's the only that drug I ever took to. in my life. So wow. you were like 370 doing coke? Yeah. Wow. I was about 420 yeah. doing coke. 420? You, ha- you should be happy your heart didn't bust. Exactly. I think it nearly did. Wow. You know, I was on the verge of having a heart attack. I couldn't bend down and tie my shoelaces up without being uh, out of breath. I, was, I look in the mirror and think, what a state. Such a shadow from your former glory only a few years ago. Well, that happened to you and cocaine for a while. You're living a life and you pass a mirror and you're looking, whoa. The Who reality sets in. Who the fuck is that? <laughs> yeah. <coughs> no good. Clean life is the best. Your face awesome, is puffy. Man. You got sores on your nose and your lips and shit. My lips and my nose and lips, you look like a fucking, I look like a leopard. <laughs> fucking herpes blisters all over my fucking face when I do fucking cocaine. It's all fucked up. All fucking blisters. I look like a fucking disease infested fucking farmant. <laughs> well, God, I mean, oh, God bless you guys, shit, man. Nigga. God bless us all for, you know, being clean and sober minded, you know. Um, Tyson, man, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. It's been my pleasure. To have you here, Mike. Great episode. Yes, absolutely. Got the champ. Have the champ in here. We took it deep. We went real deep. You're welcome back anytime. (laughs) Anytime. Please. This is going to be an awesome segment, man. Yeah, good luck in your next fight. Thank you very much. Do you want to let anybody, let everybody know where they can find you and follow you? Yeah, I'm on Instagram, gypsyking101. I'm on Twitter, Tyson underscore Fury. Awesome. Awesome. You heard it, oh. everybody. Hey, that's it for this episode of Hot Boxing. Uh, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Hot Boxing with Mike Gip Tyson. Joe Harris? Check out our website, hotboxingpodcast.com. Until next time, I'm Evan Britton. And I'm Mike Tyson. The man. And I'm the Gypsy King. The Gypsy King, and we're out of here, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.